To tell the story of this amazing computer, we need to go back to the beginning. Hey, that's too far. Let's go forward a little bit. Great designs are timeless, and the G4 Cube is about as timeless as they get. The Museum of Modern Art must have also thought so, because when the Cube was being discontinued from retail stores in 2001, they added a Cube to their collection, immortalizing it next to other technological marvels, like the 1984 original Macintosh. Even today, the G4 Cube looks futuristic and sleek and elegant. The Cube's complete antithesis, the M1 Mac Mini, is a powerhouse outperforming $5,000 Macs from just last year, all while costing under $600 for a refurbished model that I picked up. The, this quantum leap in computing power per dollar lives in one of the most drab chassis Apple has made in recent memory. I mean, there isn't anything specifically wrong with this, but come on, we've been using variants on this design since 2010. What if we could fix the weaknesses of both of these computers, combining the power of the modern M1 chip with the timeless design of the classic G4 Cube? Well, that's what I've done, and it's not as hard as you'd imagine. But first, a brief history lesson. In the late 1990s, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive set forth to design the perfect computer for the turn of the millennia. The Vision was a computer boasting all of the specs of a full-size desktop, compressed into one-fourth the volume, running virtually silent, all while being the most futuristic design imaginable. But this wasn't Steve Jobs' first Cubic computer. During his exile from Apple, Jobs started a company called Next, whose product was a supercomputer packed into a perfect cube. The Next computer system might have been a commercial bust, but each machine was a work of art. Steve ensured that every detail of the computer, both inside and out, was aesthetically pleasing. A decade later, Steve revisited the idea of a computer packed into a perfect cube, and thus the G4 Cube was born. Back in 2000, the G4 Cube was considered a speedy computer, boasting a PowerPC G4 processor, a RAGE 128 Pro graphics card, 64 megabytes of RAM, and a 20 gigabyte hard drive basically the specs of a mid-range G4 Tower Mac of the time. Amazingly, all this power was compacted into a perfect cube, one-fourth the size, and using no fans, instead relying on an innovative convection cooling system. Apple did something that is unheard of these days and designed the whole computer to be easily accessible and serviceable via the coolest telescoping handle I have ever seen. Oh yeah, the CD drive also works just like a toaster. Starting at $1,799, Apple launched the G4 Cube on July 19, 2000. Sold as a separate accessory, a new $1,000 LCD flat panel monitor, which was specifically designed to complement the new G4 Cube, was prominently featured next to the Cube in marketing. And honestly, it's the only monitor that looks right with the Cube. Note that there's no power cable to the monitor. The proprietary Apple Display Connector, or ADC, carries power, video, and USB, allowing the whole setup to run off of just one outlet. After spending over $2,800 in the year 2000, or about $4,220 first-time owners would have this sitting on their desk. A G4 Cube, a 205-watt power supply, Apple Studio Display, an Apple Pro keyboard and mouse, and a set of these really fun speakers. Unfortunately for Apple and fans of the G4 Cube, the market wasn't ready to pay a premium on what was viewed as an inferior performance when compared to other G4 Macs at the time. Apple was only able to sell 29,000 units before eventually putting the G4 Cube on ice indefinitely on July 3, 2001, less than a year after its introduction. After placing the cube on ice indefinitely, Steve Jobs told the New York Times, the cube was not a failure of design. It was a failure of concept. We targeted the cube at a professional audience. We thought that they would rather have something small on the desk than expandability. And we were wrong. It was a wrong concept fabulously implemented. Sound familiar? The failure of concept Steve was referring to really doesn't exist anymore as tens of thousands of professionals have found the M1 chip more than capable for even some of the most demanding tasks, including myself. For those uninitiated, the Apple M1 chip is a system on a chip combining an insanely powerful RISC processor with an 8-core GPU and integrated RAM. 
allowing Apple's first entry into the desktop chip market to smoke high-end Intel and AMD processors on performance and absolutely devastate them on thermal management. Many people have noted that the base M1 Mac Mini, which can be had for as little as $589 on Apple's refurbished store, easily keeps up with and outperforms last year's $5,000 MacBook Pros in everything from video and photo editing, Xcode compiling, and 3D rendering. Basically, the M1 chip is as powerful as the G4 is beautiful. Honestly, the cube just came before its time. Its time is today. Before I start tearing this computer apart, I established several design choices which I would strictly adhere to. One, in no way disturb the external design aside from the I.O. underneath the computer. Two, the power supply must be internal. This is something that Apple was unable to accomplish back in the day, so getting it implemented into the cube is a must. Three, just like the original design, I want to be able to do everything with just two cables running out of the bottom of the cube. Four, the handle mechanism cannot be disturbed. It is one of the coolest parts of the design, so it must stay. Step one is to disassemble the G4 down to its base frame. This mod will not be reversed, so I'm not overly concerned with preserving these old parts. Just look at the craftsmanship that went into this computer. It's so obvious that Steve and Johnny and the whole engineering team crafted each cubic centimeter with love and care. Each piece has its place and its purpose. Notice that the handle assembly is attached to this huge heatsink. So following my fourth commandment, I won't be changing this core piece. Thankfully, the M1 Mac Mini's internals are super small, as we'll see here in step two, so fitting everything in there shouldn't be a problem. With everything disassembled, we can now mount the Mac Mini's power supply directly to the cube's heatsink with a few screws and hot glue, and also solder the power connectors to a convenient location. Next up is the logic board of the Mac Mini with the fan and heatsink. Thankfully, there are some conveniently located vents, so we should have really good ventilation. And the last thing to do is to attach the cables to the airport antenna, LED status light, and power button. Obviously, this was a really quick overview, so if you're looking for a detailed guide where I go into the weeds in each one of these steps, take a look at the videos in the description. With the conversion complete, we're able to plug all of the peripherals to a Thunderbolt 3 dock and run all of the I.O. we need from just one port. Since this is basically a recased Mac Mini, we have a fully functioning M1 chip, functioning I.O., and easy to access internals. We've revived this dusty work of art into a computer capable of handling heavy duty modern workflows. From the research I've done, this is the most powerful, quietest, and true to original G4 cube conversion out there. Oh, and half of the cube is still empty. So let me know what you think I should be putting in the empty space. I was thinking like an SSD or maybe a DVD drive. As I mentioned earlier, I have a plethora of videos detailing each step in this whole process. And if you'd like help making an M1 cube of your own or would like to commission one, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm happy to help. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey and stay tuned for more Mac conversions.